Hey everybody, Adam Savage in my cave alongside Tyler Ham, creative director of Paragon FX Group. Now, you guys know how much I love props here. It is such a primary occupation of this cave to make them, replicate them, exult over them. And you guys have sent me some, you're a brand new, Replica Props Company. Yeah, Brand just new. a couple years old. A couple years yeah. old. Uh, and you've been sending me some of your wares, and they are beautiful. I've been doing some unboxings here on the channel. But what we're here to talk about today is your actual process. How do you bring these things to life? Because it's not only non-trivial, it is so much more complex than I think most people realize. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot behind the scenes here. And that's actually, that's why we always love, we love watching your videos when you look at our stuff, because we get to see both someone who appreciates the aesthetic and the delivery, but also has an appreciation of what it took to get from uh, from concept to your doorstep. Well, and yeah, mm -hmm. within the making of things, I yeah. have been a professional maker for, mm -hmm. for decades, but I also spent a few years in manufacturing, which yep. is a fundamentally different beast. Absolutely. Uh, so, and you come from the prop manufacturing, prop making standpoint, right? Yeah, yeah, both me and uh, my partner Ryland, both Ryland, Ryland was very technical in the engineering. He was a, a custom builder for years, worked for a lot of the companies that anyone who's spent any time in the space knows. Yeah. Uh, I, and I, the, I have traded props with Ryan yeah, yeah, over, for, over for, the last couple of decades. For decades. Yeah. And uh, I started out in uh, film visual effects and then switched over to uh, collectibles and prop replicas from there. Well, so you guys sent me this piece, this beautiful bat yes. grapnel. And I did a full unboxing of this. We'll include a link in the description. Um, I talked about this extensively as like one of my favorite prop replicas I've, I've encountered because it feels so much like exactly what I would imagine the in-universe piece to feel like. Well, that, that's what we wanted. When we built this, uh, that's why. And so when you hold the pieces, you fit them together, they click hard, it's cold, it's heavy. They pieces yeah. spin, spin, they click. Yeah, you can put the, the dart in. And kind of uh, when we go about doing this, yeah. there's always this, because um, people buy these types of things, it's not always necessarily just to have something like on the shelf or like a poster you have in the wall. Yeah. It's, this is my connection. You know, I just pulled this directly out of the screen. Yes. I am Batman for a minute. Uh huh. And if you can get that feel and capture that feel in something, that's like, job is done. Like, that's what you want. You want someone to open that like it's Christmas morning. Now, that means that this is a lot of machined parts as well as die cast parts. Am I correct about that? This prototype was all hand machined. All hand machined. All so hand you machine. have the first hand machine prototype of the grapnel here. Yeah, so this that's is, right in here. I love these. Oh, can I? Yeah, absolutely. Oh man, can you guys release one that looks just like this? I know, <laughs> I've wanted, we, were, we wanted to show these pictures off. The first time we saw our fully machined one assembled oh. and, and to Ryland's credit, um, when we were getting this, this was all hand machine. Yeah. This, this, this was looking over shoulders and machine shops. Right. This, this, this was, all, you know, old school on the ground, making sure all the clearances were correct, making sure you got that, you know, when you, these two parts go together, it, it punches, like right, it right. clicks into place. I don't think mm -hmm. people really understand or, res or, or get just how complex this is because when you're manufacturing a product let's say you're mm -hmm. making something like this yep. you have these aesthetic marks to hit and these performance and mm -hmm. you know you want it to work in a certain way and all the same applies here except you also have to hit this perfect aesthetic mark because yep. the people spending money on the stuff you're selling are completely unforgiving if the aesthetics aren't dead to the money completely unforgiving <laughs> and it, it's also uh you're, you're also in a place where you're sort of managing uh, people's expectations of do they want what they think they saw on screen? Do they want something that looks like on screen but as first built? They want to look like how it looked on the set. So, and and especially like if something like the uh, like the knife, for example. Yeah. Uh, you sell that to someone and if there's a scratch on the case, it, no, no one cares. It, right. It's a utility knife. Right. You get one of these out and there's oh, a scratch no. and it's not only is it a return, but it, it's kind of a heartbroken customer. Oh my gosh. And so so <laughs> is that something you have to educate your manufacturer on about what QC, obviously what QC is acceptable? Oh, absolutely. We have sort of uh, a policy where- QC by, I mean quality, quality control. control. Yeah. Where we will actually go through and especially some manufacturers that we work with uh, that are more familiar with high-end collectibles mm -hmm. and replicas, uh, they, they sort of come in with a more of an understanding. 
of, you know, th this is the Because customer. they have worked in that space. Because they've done it. They understand and that extra care that needs to be spent. Yeah. Okay. And, and they, they don't want to, they don't want returns either. Right. And they, and they want us happy and, you know, the, the end customer being happy is what makes us happy, is what makes everybody happy. And so a lot of times we'll have, uh, some, some of the manufacturers are really good with that. But yeah. sometimes, you know, when you're working in overseas, and especially in things like uh, specific collectibles where you're not dealing with tens of thousands, you're dealing with hundreds, hundreds or thousands, right. you'll find that some of the factories that you use aren't necessarily even collectible factories. Right. You know, and so they, they'll do something like, uh, they could do dishware. Right. And so they have the equipment and the knowledge and they can, they can make something that's you know like a like a sphere or something you know like a batarang. But with so. a shop like that, but, sometimes you might send them a prototype and say match this, and they yeah. send you back something that is different, completely different. <laughs> because, and that doesn't, and it's not because they're dumb. Absolutely, they're not. simply applying your problem to their way of solving that problem. Yeah, and their logic of what is wrong, the the level. You know, like right. if, if if you're used to making spoons and dishes or doorknobs. Like uh, little flaws in in the surface aren't a big deal, but if you're making a you prop, know, a prop that someone has been waiting years for and is you know no, none of these things are an, an insignificant amount of money. You know it it there's a responsibility yeah. to deliver something to someone who's giving you hard earned money for it, and there's uh when when that part is missing, that's where the education comes in. Well, and, and I think that people don't realize that manufacturers, every kind of manufacturer, every version of a manufacturer has its own way of solving its problems, absolutely. of doing its business. Absolutely. And that, those, those ways that they have are part of their institutional inertia. Yes. And mm -hmm. I don't think people realize that you could send, you can say to a part that a company that makes aluminum pieces, I'm sending you a piece, make a piece exactly like this. And you might still get back a piece that is fundamentally different in a lot of the aspects. Oh, absolutely. Because uh, a lot of times too, the people who are actually doing the manufacturing on the shop floor yeah. aren't necessarily the people that you're speaking with. And so someone will make a call on the shop floor well, where you say, I want, you know, I want it like this and they'll go, you know, it'd be better if we did it this way. So it's a game of telephone. Yeah, and it, it even though it might be better structurally or for whatever they're, and it's it's always, it's not malicious. No. It's, it's we think this would work better. And I don't want to cast. then it's wrong, I, you, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, I don't want to cast aspersions, yeah. but I do remember a prop, replica mm -hmm. from years ago by another company in which uh, there was a lid and the yep. lid was mounted upside down. Yeah. On the actual piece. And they ended up having, the, they saw, I got one. And I was like, what's wrong with the lid? Mm -hmm. They're like, well, it's mounted upside down. And I'm like, why did you sell it then? And they were like, well, we got it, like we bought a thousand like that. And yeah. it was like, no, that's a real expense to them. But sometimes you, you don't find out those errors until they're in your, your warehouse. Wow. And so uh, like w when we do this, we have, we have extreme checks and balances. And so we, we do our own quality control throughout just. But extreme yeah. checks and balances is an expensive proposition right it, like you have to incorporate you have to yes. be able to manage all that QC and still be able to sell your thing and make some a little bit of money on the side right? well it's also time consuming yeah and, and yeah. so you, you have people and that that's why we we're not like a, a big big pre-order you know way in advance company mm -hmm. because we'd rather not feel the pressure of delivering to people who've paid versus the pressure of getting it right fair so enough. the people are happy when they get it fair enough that mm -hmm. makes total sense um so can you talk me through some of the particular issues you might have had between the prototype and the manufacturing of the grapnel gun oh absolutely well I, ironically and so you know as we were just talking about so this is all hand done yeah. at a great expense of time. Right. Because it was literally, you know, piece by piece. Oh, dude, this was Just, some of the, this is, doing toy prototyping was mm -hmm. actually one of the more lucrative side hustles I had going when I was a professional model maker. Yeah, well, I mean, because it's, it takes such a specific attention to detail. Yeah. And it take, and I, I thought I was detail oriented before I got into this industry, <laughs> and then once I was in it, I, I, I was like, I, I'm just like a toy slob, I guess. Like I, I, I wouldn't, you know, it, it took a while to kind of educate the eye. The biggest kind of, the the funniest part of this was halfway during. There's kind of a saying where people say, you know. What's the worst thing that can happen when you're developing a replica? Yeah. It's that someone finds the real one, the screen used one. <laughs> oh, right, because you know, you've done all your research from some standard reference and you're and using the real photos, reference shows and then, up. And then all of a sudden you're you're halfway through development and the real one shows up. Well, during this, the real one showed up. Oh, no. 
And uh, that one, it went up for auction. And, and then you discovered that many of your assumptions were slightly wrong. And then we had to kind of, we had to like stop, we had to stop manufacturing yeah. to go back and just like, like, well, now we have better photos of like, but little things like, you know, like, like <laughs> this like, must kill you because like the this most, on, sorry, you know, I just realized that the most likely circumstance for the real one showing up is you releasing the replica, right? It, sorry, but go ahead. No, it, it's, it's, it's like a blessing and a curse. Yeah, of course, of mm. course. So tell me about this. And so it was just like little things. Like we noticed all of a sudden on on the the one that came up that like this was a, shaped a little different. And it's really minor things. This little too. sight just here. Just this little teeny piece right here. Yeah. And it's um it's one of those those things too where you, you go like how many people would notice? You ask that question. And you ask it, and then you get to that point where you're like, it doesn't matter how many people notice, because we notice. And and we are both such sticklers for. I mean, that's you know the the company's named Paragon. I mean, so we, there's pressure right. there. You've set expectations. Yeah, we've set expectations from the name to just try to make exemplary models of everything we do. And so we're we are not afraid to if something comes up. Hey, yeah, let's yeah. let's stop this. Let let's re revise it. We we have some products that we've been revising for well over a year. Well, so let, mm -hmm. let's talk about some of the other franchises you are playing in. I, I notice here, this feels like a deep cut to me, is the Phantasm Murder Ball. Yeah. <laughs> this is gorgeous. Thank you. Um, and I, I, I have to say at the outset, I see a shiny chrome ball and I sense nothing but headaches. Yes. That's, a, <laughs> uh, that's another thing too. When, when at the end of the production run, you don't want someone to pull their ball out of the box and there's fingerprints all over it. No, they're, oh, and, right, you even know, that. Yeah, even that. And so we have strict uh, conditions in uh, back and forth. You know, these all need to be uh, polished before they're placed in. Everything right. has to be white gloved. Oh, and mm -hmm. then, I mean, even down to little tiny things, the angles, these come out of the balls, the angles, mm -hmm. they come out this way. Every one of those angles is a, is a critical measurement. It is, because a lot of times when you see these uh, at horror conventions, when you kind of are looking, a lot of times the knockoffs just assume that, that these come straight out. Right, of course. And no, they're actually, there's a slight, they, slight it bend looks, Yeah, out. they go towards mm -hmm. the center a little bit. We're doing this one, we call this one the Mr. Potato Head, because uh, this is actually, this isn't even the final version. This okay. is just a more final prototype. Yeah. But we're gonna have the drill bit accessory and then the tri-blade accessory. Oh, so you can... So the tri-blade's gonna fit into here. <laughs> That's appalling, yeah, I love it. it's gonna stick on. And at, at this point, we're just finalizing uh, just our packaging, and not even the external packaging. There's a lot to think about with, um, like it's called drop testing, which I think a lot of people don't realize. Oh, right, you've gotta be able to pack it so someone can drop kick it out of a, a delivery van and it still arrives like, perfect. Really drop kick it. Yeah. Like someone can throw it out of, out of a van and it can land on your deck and still survive. <laughs> and so it's not, <laughs> you know, it has to get loaded from a factory yeah. onto a boat, get unloaded, and then get shipped to your door. Well, and, I mean, to your point mm -hmm. of lest you wonder if anyone's gonna notice, I have seen threads on the RPF where people are in a thread talking about a limited edition of 100 stuff that came out, and mm -hmm. 20 of the receivers of that prop are on the thread comparing their as-delivered versions, whether there are scratches or fingerprints. Like, no. they are hard tracking this stuff on your dime, right? And, <laughs> it, oh, yeah, and that's why we have to take such precautions with it. I mean, there is such a thing as, you know, we are designing the interior foam. Yeah, yeah. You know, there, there is, and everything is thought out because like, like you said, you know, one, one thing goes wrong and people, write, people are writing about it. So talk to me about the, this 3D printed murder ball here. I know that's not exactly what it's called, but um, how does this fit into your, in your prototyping process? So when we were prototyping this one, uh, we decided to go a 3D route versus actually hand machining. Mm -hmm. We did a 3D version of this. Okay. And because uh, we wanted to make sure that the size was right, uh, we went up and we took reference from the, uh, they're technically, the, people call them the Sentinel Sphere. Uh, and so there is one from Phantasm II up in the Pop Culture Museum. Oh, in, yeah. Uh, up in, in Washington. Seattle, yeah. Yeah, in Seattle. And so I went there, I took a bunch of pictures, got sort of a basic, you can get a basic idea of about how big it is, you yeah. know, looking through the glass. And then, so we kind of wanted to make sure, you know, it's 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 an odd size. It's kind of like not softball, not baseball, but like it's a. <laughs> it's not know. a standard sphere. Yeah, and so we just wanted to make sure that the size that we chose, based on 
uh, what we had deduced from photogrammetry and everything right. just felt right. Because you, you can you can guesstimate it and you can look at it in 3D yeah. and you can you know do cutouts. But I mean, the 3D printing technology is here, so why not use it? And By it's, all means, and that allows you a great to, tool for this. That allows you to make multiple versions of slightly different sizes and choose the exact one. That, yeah. And this is great because you guys are, look, I, I always say on the channel here, I'm looking at props that give me a specific experience as we mm -hmm. were talking about of like, it's the real thing pulled from the screen. And so you guys are using your institutional expertise to be like, yeah, this is the one that, this is the experience. Yeah. Is but it, it's like that. It's, it's you know how, uh, it, I guess it's the equivalent of when a restaurateur says mouthfeel. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, it's like prop feel. Uh -huh. Like the, this is prop, prop feel. feel. Yeah. And this feels right. Oh, and that's, that's great. That's kind of how we felt with this. Like, you know, you get it, you hold it. Like, it feels right. Yeah. I mean, the only thing I wanted to do was like have it rattle around in the wheel well of my car for a few weeks. Yeah, so get a little it, like, banged up. Yeah, a little, mm -hmm. a little dinged, a little bit weathered around the edges. So I, you guys have, uh, you brought here a piece I didn't know you were making and I would like to talk about it. The, uh, yeah. the John Hammond came back here. Oh, You've this got is... a little Jurassic Park going on. Yes, we love this piece. This was one of the ones that when the company was started, when we both were talking about, you know, like what every prop maker maker does, you know, what would you make? What would you make? Right, what we right, make? right. That that was a, a top, a okay, list topper. Okay, so talk mm -hmm. to me. This is the this is a piece I've always been curious about. First of all, this is licensed, so this is totally accurate in terms of the cane. Yes. And, yes. Um, okay, and. I purchased one of these that seemed like it was way too inexpensive and discovered that the mosquito I had purchased was a clear plastic print of a mosquito in a clear ball so that to most mm -hmm. of the world, it looked like that. But, from the side and but then from it, the side. it disappears yeah. as you twist. I was very sad about that. How did you do this, this mosquito? That was, it was funny because that was actually a question that we were asking when we were doing it. Because, they, I mean, those aren't flying around anywhere. Right. You know, there, there's nowhere to, where they're, where they're farming them. Oh, right. And so that's actually a 3D printed bug. No way. Yeah, with, uh, I believe the legs are just a thin, like a thin wire. It looks like they're almost a wire, but it's, yeah. their wings have, um, their wings have actually some design on them. Yeah, and there's so There's specular a, stuff going mm, on on there. It's a wing, uh, Sort of a wing, I guess you'd call it like a vein pattern. I'm not sure what the technical That's, and you've term 3D that printed is. that into acetate or something. It's it's just printed on acetate. And wow, cut out. it looks so mm -hmm. freaking good. We were really excited when we saw this because also, I mean, there's parts of this industry where when you're doing it, uh, even though you're prototyping it, you're still not sure how it's going to work out. Right, right. And so it was like 3D printed bug with acetate wings. Like, oh, let's see. And then they show up, and you're like, wow, wow, like this is. And that it's kind of, it takes you out of being a manufacturer and puts you back into being a fan again for a oh. minute. And you know, you kind of get that, you know, even though you've worked on this thing every day for months, yeah, you get that first look feel again. Now, I bet you also get this experience of being able to look at like fifty of these all at once, which yeah. is its own particular kind of weird pleasure. I'll bet. Well, and then you get photos of, of the assembly lines and the... <laughs> right. And am I correct that this is cast into resin, which means there's a whole post-polishing uh, 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 process mm -hmm. for this? Yes. That's non-trivial. No. No, not, none of it really is. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> polish is literally the most unforgiving process there is. And this is a slightly irregular shape. Yeah. And that, that was another interesting thing, too. It, it's not, you know, a lot of times you see them and, and it's assumed it's just egg. Egg shaped, right? But it's not egg shaped. It's got sort of this organic it's a piece of stone. Amber. Yeah, it's yeah. it's a piece of amber, and so getting that right and you know figuring out. I mean, we 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 were directing the manufacturer and how to set the bug. Yeah, of so course you must be. Yeah, it's not just randomly. No put part in of there. it's too close to the yeah, outside. And we have we kind of named A, B, and C because they're sort of edges. You know, you call them edges. So it's right. like A edge, B edge, C edge, and we need the bug to be like if you're looking down, the bug needs to be at this angle, and this is A edge and B edge, <sighs> and because we wanted it to just look right from how you would be holding it. Sure, sure. You know, because if you're holding it kind of in like the the hero pose, uh -huh. but the bug's facing you, you can't really see it. You kind of need that profile. Wow. To fit, yeah. There's a, a lot more. Again, it's not just people like dumping bugs into resin and, yeah, and yeah. clear coating it. Um, and then is this uh, is this is this injection molded? The cane part? 
That is resin pour. It is resin pour. Yes. It's a very flexible, it's a lovely resin. It's got a great feel to it. No, we were really, really happy with it. I mean, we hope no one actually uses it as a cane because I don't think that's gonna be the one that supports your body weight. Fair enough, you don't have an armature in there. No, no. Yeah, okay. But it's a... Uh, so not to be used as a cane. Yeah. Fair just, enough. But to be used as a, a lovingly decorative uh, replica. It is really, really gorgeous. I just, I, I, I've long thought about this prop and wondered about how people did the mosquito. And this has been like a lot of people on the RPF over the last 30 years mm -hmm. have made versions of this. There yeah. are a lot of replicas of this and you still had to burn brand new territory to figure out your own method. Yeah. Well, also it's a, uh, when you're doing it at a more of a scale, mm -hmm. you definitely need a more, you need consistency. Of course, of course. Yeah, and, and then you need to name sides of a bug and mm -hmm. have maps of mosquitoes in your, that's what people don't see is, I mean, this this is metaphorical, but you know, the stack of paperwork that goes back and forth with notes, you know, I mean, the, as in PDFs, but it's just imagine. pages and pages and yeah, you know, bug angles and, <laughs> and color call outs and, and all sorts of stuff. And it's just all back and forth, note, 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 note. And if you change manufacturers, you'd have to go through all of that again. And that happens. Right. And that happens sometimes uh, because Midstream, a manufacturer might tell you, we have to let this job go and move yeah, on. That happens, you know, sometimes we will change manufacturers right. and sometimes manufacturers just change. Wow. Or, um, or a subcontractor will change mm -hmm. it. Right. Or like um, like Chinese New Year, big holiday. Oh, and, and that will mm -hmm. close everything down. That closes everything down. And then when uh, some of those factories start re-upping afterwards, yeah. uh, either, so, you know, sometimes a lot of employees will leave one factory and just start their own factory over Chinese New Year. And then all of a sudden you don't have a factory anymore. Or the or, same or, people in the, oh mm -hmm. my God. Okay, so you have one more prop to show here, again from Jurassic Park, and I have not seen this. Yeah, no, this is this is a debut. Please. I am very excited about this. Also, I I really dig your guys' packaging. I, 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 I love this. Is Thank this you. a digital set of digital files that you had made up? I actually did this. You actually built this? Yeah. <laughs> I did the packaging design from reference photos. Oh, so a, a digital assembly. Oh, that's great. Mm. Ah, it is the Barbasol. So this is famously the shaving cream can in which uh, Dennis Nedry hides the dinosaur DNA. Mm. Yep. Oh my gosh. And this is such a classic uh, Jurassic Park piece. It's sort of the one that I feel like when you say Jurassic Park props, this is it, what everyone's thinking about. That's the about. default. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God, it's beautiful. Yeah, thank and this you. is one like we know the confines and the shape. We understand this prop, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Like it's it is a known quantity. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about some of the manufacturing difficulties in making this one. Got well. Oh, that's so gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> For one, it's uh, it's done a, a lot of. I think there's sort of a, a misconception when you when you talk to people about manufacturing mm -hmm. as a customer, that you just send your idea to a manufacturer. Right. And they and they send it back. Sure. And it's and it's done and it's beautiful. And you know, you, you send them your your artwork and you get it back in a in a nice box ready to go. Right, right. And so, but the reality is, you know, there's a manufacturer for the machine work. Yep. There are manufacturers for these little capsules. There's manufacturers for uh Wraps. There's manufacturers for the plastic lid. Each there, one of these is a separate manufacturer, a separate factory, a separate set yeah. of design goals. Mm -hmm. And then there's a, uh, someone who makes the packaging. Oh my god! And, and then uh, they all have to get made, get approved, get QC'd, get brought together, get assembled, <laughs> put together, pass your drop testing, and to get to your door. And you also have to choose a yellow liquid that's not going to deteriorate over time or rot or change color. Well, we leave that up to the customer because we actually, another thing, you can't ship a product like that with liquid. <gasps> and so we, we, we set this one up for, And you make for a you suggestion guys. to yeah, the Yeah, so we'll customer. make suggestions oh, nice. as to, uh, to what is the, the proper dino DNA color. Oh my God, that's great. I just, that must have been real fun to get this prototype. It was really fun. <laughs> and this is a prototype, yes? Uh, this is a, a final. A this final is a final. Production okay. Piece. Yes, it's um. That's really. It's really another cool. one of those ones where, again, when you open it up after you've been working on it for yeah. so long, yeah, it it brings you, it it's it's like little kid Christmas again. <laughs> and you would think, you know, you it's there's so many times when also during development of everything, yeah. you get to the point where you're 
just kind of tired of, of looking at something. And you get that, that product burnout. Yeah, and, and then yeah. you work through it, and then you get to hold it in your hands, and it's just like you, you forget all the ills, and it's just all, <laughs> all the smiles. That is, uh, 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 Fellini was famous for saying he knew one of his films was almost done when he totally despised it. I can, uh-huh, yes, <laughs> <Yeah>. absolutely. <laughs> Tyler, I really, really appreciate this deep dive. I, I, as you know, on the videos about these, I talk a lot about how difficult it is to make this stuff and to make it at the fidelity your customer base demands. Um, you guys are just killing it. It's really, really lovely. Well, thank thank you. you so much. And this has been amazing. Thank you so Absolutely, much for having man. me. Can't wait to see what you guys are going to make next. See you guys next time. I can't thank you enough for supporting us by watching the channel. If you've been to our merch store, you might want to head there again because we are always updating our roster with new products. Here is the anime-inspired tested logo in Japanese, my, one of my all-time favorite new designs. Uh, we're also selling tested mugs and tested hats. Oh, and if you want a cup of tea, we're selling that too. Tested-store.com. Tested-store.com.